Joyce Meyer Ministries dankt haar donateurs die deze uitzending mogelijk maakten. To know that God loved me and that nobody could ever take that away from me. And that no matter what had happened to me, no matter what had been done to me, and no matter what I had done, I was a new creature in Christ. That all things had passed away and all things had become brand new. When you know who you are in Christ, you don't have to cower in fear. And always be afraid to try something new or do something that you haven't done before. Now, I'm not suggesting we just do foolish things, but if you feel like that God wants you to try something, don't let the fear of failure stop you from trying. Put no confidence in the flesh. Your confidence doesn't need to be in what people think of you or say about you or who you know or don't know or what group you're in or not in. Not your level of education, not what you own, not where you live, not your address, not the kind of car you drive, not the label in your clothes. Nothing. Put your confidence in Christ. Because in Him, we're all equal. No more male nor female. No more Jew nor Greek. No more slave nor free. He tore down the dividing walls between us, and we have all become one in Him. One person is no better than another based on what they can do or what they know or anything else. What we can do came from God, and what we can't do, we have to trust Him with. I like to say we're everything, nothing's everything in Him and nothing without Him. Amen. Well, my identity was stolen. The devil likes to get after you young. I was abused by my dad, sexually abused by my dad. And many of you have heard my story, or you have the same story, or if it's not that story, it's a version of that story. Or maybe you were made fun of in school, or maybe you had a learning disability and that was a problem. Who knows, you know? But the devil makes arrangements for everybody to get hurt in their journey. There's very few perfect little families, and even the ones that look that way sometimes have their own brand of dysfunction behind closed doors. I was abused, I was screamed at and yelled at all the time. I was a nervous wreck. By the time I was a teenager, I was already having physical problems because of the pressure that I lived under. My dad was not only abusive, he was an absolute tyrant. You never could please him. You never knew what kind of a mood he was going to be in from one day to the next. I'm so grateful that God gave me a stable man to be married to. I tell you, stability is a wonderful thing when you can count on somebody being the same all the time. That's one of the things we love about Jesus, isn't it? Yeah. Always the same. I did not feel loved. And certainly any kind of affection I ever did get had to be earned. It wasn't something that was given just because. I did not feel accepted. I did not feel normal. I lived in fear and hiding, full of shame, blame, and all kinds of condemnation, but God. But God, Joseph's brothers hated him and they hated him all the more, but God, amen? Let me tell you something, I don't care what the world has done to you, what God can do for you will override anything that they've done to you. Isaiah 61, the first three verses are so beautiful and they bring so much healing to our lives if we'll just believe them for ourselves. Prophesying about Jesus, the Bible says, the Spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord hath anointed and qualified me to preach the gospel of good tidings to the meek, the poor, and the afflicted. He has sent me to bind up and to heal the brokenhearted. God's not just interested in your spirit. He wants to work in your soul. He wants to heal your mind. He wants to heal your emotions. He wants you to feel good about yourself, not in yourself, but in Him. Amen. He wants to heal your finances. He wants you to have good relationships. He came to heal the brokenhearted. Amen. To proclaim liberty to the captives and the opening of the prison and of the eyes to those that are bound. See, your prison's really already open. It doesn't even say He came to open prison doors. He came to declare that the prison doors were open. 
Whatever prison you've been living in, I'm here to tell you tonight that it is open. All you have to do is walk out. You are forgiven. You have been set free from guilt and condemnation and shame. You are free from bondages and addictions. It's already bought and paid for with the blood of Jesus. All you have to do is believe it and 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 say it and say it and say it and believe it and believe it and say it and believe it and believe it until all of a sudden you're like, I got it. Meditation brings revelation. You don't just need information, you need revelation. Don't be a lazy Christian. So many people want everybody else to spoon feed them the Word, and you don't mind sitting in a chair all comfy and letting somebody preach to you. But let me tell you, if I say anything to you tonight that strikes a chord in you, you need to write it down. Perhaps you need to buy the recorded message from this service and you need to listen to it over and over. Well, I might have to wait in a line and I want to get my car out of the parking lot before everybody else does. Well, then why don't you just stay in bondage? Because if you're not going to do your part, there's nothing anybody can do for you. Amen? No, you got to meditate. As you meditate on the Word of God day and night, it becomes a reality to you. I didn't know anything about the love of God. Oh, I could talk about it, but I didn't really know it for myself because every time something didn't work out right, I thought, well, God, don't you love me? And every time somebody got something that I didn't have that I wanted, well, God, don't you love me? You must love them more than you love me. And when we have trials and tragedies, well, God, don't you love me? But when you know that you know that you know that you know that God loves you and He loves you unconditionally, you will never say that to God. You will never insult Him by saying that to Him. You will say in the midst of your deepest trials and tragedies, nothing can separate me from the love of God. Because you will know the height, the depth, the length, and the breadth of the love that God has for you. The Bible says in Romans 8 that nothing will separate you from the love of God. Well, when I went to teach my very first public meeting. I spent five years teaching home Bible studies, and then I started a, a women's meeting at a new church that had opened in St. Louis, and it was a Thursday morning meeting. And I tell you what, I really wanted a word of power for the hour. I thought this was my shining moment, and my ministry was starting, and I wanted a powerful word from God. And as I prayed about what to preach on, God said, I want you to tell my people that I love them. And I thought, Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. And I just thought, God, I don't want to do that. I want a powerful message. I, that's exactly what I, I still remember the park that I walked around in and prayed before I went to do that first sermon. And I remember to this day what God said to me. He said, no, Joyce, my people don't know that I love them. If they did, they would not behave the way they do. For one thing, perfect love casts out fear. We don't have a full revelation on how much God loves us and that He's with us if we're still being motivated and ruled by fear. Now, you may feel fear. We're all going to feel fear. But you don't have to bow down to it if you know that the greater one is with you. I said you may feel fear. But that doesn't mean you have to be afraid. There's a difference in what you feel and who you are. Maybe you don't feel confident, but you can be confident in Christ. Amen? Maybe you don't feel like walking in love, but you can choose to walk in love anyway. You may not feel like forgiving, but you can choose to forgive anyway. Oh, you don't want to miss tomorrow. Amen? And the more that you meditate on the Word, the more it will become a reality to you. Well, through that message, I began to realize I didn't have a revelation on the love of God either. And so the first year of my public ministry, everybody say year. year. You know, that's like 365 days. The first year of my ministry, for myself personally, I studied the love of God. I read everything I get my hands on. I looked up every scripture. I looked up definitions. I wrote out notes in longhand. 
I underlined everything I could in my Bible, and I began to confess out loud many times a day, God loves me. I would drive down the highway, God loves me. God loves me. I would even say things like, not the postman or the mailman or the milkman, God, the creator of the universe, loves me, me. Joyce Meyer, Fenton, Missouri, nobody from nowhere, God loves me. And he's watching over me right now. And he's chosen me on purpose, picked me out as his own, made me blameless in him without condemnation, above reproach, without shame. Well, you know, in the beginning, it didn't do much to me. But as I continued to say it and I continued to study it, I'm going to tell you what, light started da dawning on the darkness in my soul. And I started getting excited and I started getting fired up and I started not letting the devil walk all over me anymore. You got to fight the good fight of faith. And you can't just agree when you're in church and somebody else is preaching to you in your midnight hour when you're down and nobody's for you and everybody's against you. That's when you've got to take hold of this stuff and say, I know who I am in Christ. And I will have the victory because it is guaranteed to me by the Holy Spirit. I like that guarantee. I am guaranteed that I will become what Jesus says that I will become, and I will have what he says that I can have. It's a guarantee. There's not one thing that the devil can do about it. It's guaranteed by the Holy Ghost. He gives us beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for mourning the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness. And he makes us trees of righteousness. The planting of the Lord. Why does God do all of this? That he might be glorified. That he, do you know, it gave glory to God tonight when this woman testified about what a mess she was and what God has done for her. The change in you gives glory to God. We are trophies of God's grace. We are the trophies in God's trophy case in heaven. Look at what he's done in you. Ephesians 2.10. Let's take a look at it. For we are God's own handiwork, his workmanship. Recreated in Christ. Born again that we may do those good works which God predestined, planned ahead of time for us, taking paths which he prepared ahead of time that we should walk in them, living the good life. Everybody say the good life. <laughs> living the good life which he prearranged and made ready for us to live. Now somebody might be saying, well, I'd like to have the good life. Well, let me ask you a question. What do you believe? How do you talk? And what do you think? Can I say it again? What do you really believe? How do you think? And how do you talk? I believe every time we open our mouth, we either increase our power or we decrease our power. The power of life and death is in the tongue. You can minister life or death to yourself based on how you talk about yourself. Don't ever say, I'm stupid, I'm dumb, I'm fat, I'm ugly, I'm this, I'm that. I'm just a big mess up, I can't do anything right. No, you need to be saying about you what the Bible says about you. In yourself, you may be all of those things, just like I am. But get out of yourself. Get over yourself. Forget about yourself, lose sight of yourself, and step over here in Christ where you belong. And say, now I know what I am in me, but in Christ. Oh my gosh, I remember how excited I got when I first began to learn these things 25 and 30 years ago. After so many years of just being a religious person and never having any joy and never having any peace, to know that God loved me and that nobody could ever take that away from me. And that no matter what had happened to me, no matter what had been done to me, and no matter what I had done, 
I was a new creature in Christ. That old things had passed away and all things had become brand new. And that I was changing and would, con I'm excited about changing. Thank God that this time next year, I'll be in better shape than I am right now. And so will you. When you leave this conference, you'll be in better shape than you were when you came. You're going to know some stuff you didn't know. You're going to feel better than you did when you walked in. I'm not where I need to be, but thank God I'm not where I used to be. Amen. In the world, we have definitely an identity crisis. It says that there's a physio-social state of disorientation and role confusion <laughs> in the world. If people don't know who they are, if they have an identity crisis, it develops from conflicting pressures and expectations and creates a state of disorientation and role confusion. Now we know that we've got that today. People can't figure out who they are or what they are or, or why they're here. They're so unhappy in what they are that they're trying to be something that they're not. And what a mess it creates. We try to please people. We try to be what everybody thinks that we should be. We wear a mask. We live phony lives. We're not honest even with ourselves. And we even try to be hyper-religious in an effort to please God. Well, I tried that. Oh my gosh. Read the Bible through every year, pray in tongues an hour every day, do this, do that, do, do, do. Don't miss a prayer meeting, don't do this, don't do that, don't do something else. Try to pray four hours every day, confess the word one hour a day. I mean, I had so many rules and religious things that I was doing. I mean, before I'd go to preach, I had to pray and not eat and pray and stomp around and pray and pray and nobody could talk to me and nobody could touch me because they couldn't hurt my anointing. I mean, I was about a nutcase after every conference was over. I mean, honestly, I'm telling you the truth. It would take me almost four days to overcome and recover from every conference that I did. And it wasn't because, you know, now I'm just like, this ain't work. I mean, now, yes, I'm tired because it takes a lot out of me physically, but I'm not drained emotionally when everything is over. Because this is up to God. It ain't up to me. I'm not here to impress you. I'm here to try to do what I believe God's telling me to do. And I hope you like me. But if you don't, that's your problem and not mine. And I don't mean that in a sarcastic way. It's just, what can I do about it? I, cannot, I got to the point where I could not keep trying to rework myself. I mean, I tried to make my voice sound sweeter. And I tried not to be so in-your-face aggressive. I begged God to give me some dessert messages. Why do I have to go tell everybody off everywhere I go? I want to just fly into town and prophesy to everybody and give them a word and do a few miracles and leave. No, I got to beat everybody up. I got to tell everybody what's wrong with them and straighten up and if you don't and this and that. But no matter what I tried, it all came out the same way. My son said to me one day after traveling with me for about 10 years, he said, well, what, are, what kind of a title are you putting on the crucifixion of the flesh tonight? He said, because no matter what you call it, that's what it ends up to be. <laughs> Die to self, straighten up, behave the way God wants you to, and you know, he was pretty much right. Stop trying to be something you're not. Get happy with who you are. You're wonderful. You're beautiful. You're fearfully and wonderfully made. God looked at everything he made and said, it is good. It is very good. Amen. Stop trying to be perfect. If you don't happen to have a gift of memorization, stop trying to memorize stuff in the Bible just because somebody else does. And there's a story that I like to tell. It seems like I've told it often lately, but it's coming up in my heart again. I was at a conference one time and there was a lady who had a gift of memorization. And before I spoke, they asked her to come up and quote an entire Psalm. And so she did, and it was quite impressive, and she got a little small hand clap. 
And I knew why people were not excited. I knew exactly why, because what she could do made them feel threatened. You see, if we don't know who we are in Christ, we cannot even enjoy somebody else's gift. Because we're too busy wondering what's wrong with us because we can't do it. I tried to learn how to play a guitar because, you know, my neighbor, the next door neighbor that was here this morning, Miss Arts and Crafts, by the way, she also played the guitar and sang. <laughs> so I got a guitar and I tried to learn how to play it and the singing thing was not going to work because whatever key I sing in, nobody can figure out what it is. <laughs> and I have little, I have short fingers. The fingernails make them look longer, but they're really pretty short and I really can't get my fingers around the guitar and I failed music too. That was the other thing I failed. I really wasn't dumb. I actually was the valedictorian of my class, but I just couldn't get the English and the, the music thing down. I didn't care about do, re, mi, fa, sol, la, ti, do, and I didn't care about nouns and pronouns and verbs. I just wanted to talk and go about my business. Amen? You can't enjoy somebody else's gift when you're busy trying to be what they are. And when you're busy trying to be what somebody else is, then you can't be fully who you are. You're awesome in Christ. You can do something that nobody else can do. You don't have to look like somebody else or be like somebody else. Well, I knew how. I knew that a lot of them were thinking, well, man, I, I, can't, I haven't memorized any songs. <laughs> so I got up right behind her and I thought, well, I'm going to set this right. So I said, well, isn't our sister's gift wonderful? I said, but I feel led to tell you that I've never memorized one psalm. Man, I got a thunderous applause. <laughs> they were really happy for my inability. <laughs> You'd be amazed how you, will be, how you will endear yourself to people if you will occasionally humble yourself to share with them what you can't do. Come on. The devil hates a confident person. Well, I tell you what, Jesus was confident. And ooh, they accused him of blasphemy. The religious people were after him, and it was really the devil working through the religious people. Because there's no place that the devil likes to hide more than in religion. Amen? <laughs> Jesus said some stuff, man. I and my Father are one. I know the Father and He knows me. Before Abraham was, I am. I only do what I see my Father do. I only say what I hear my Father say. I know where I came from. I know what I was sent to do. I know where I'm going. I know who I am. I don't know, I had planned to take the scripture, I don't have time now, but it's pretty hilarious because they accused him of blasphemy. <laughs> and always furiously came after him. And it's only because the devil hates a confident person. Many of the nastiest, meanest articles that have been written about me. One in particular, I remember, Meyer says she likes herself. Now, you know what, if I would have said, oh, I am a pathetic worm. I hate myself. I am so lowly. Then they might have put my picture in the paper and said something nice, but. You just try to act like you know who you are and have any confidence, and you just try to believe what the Bible says about you. Come on, you just try to believe what the Bible says about you, and you wait and see how the religious devils act. Well, who do you think you are? I'm nothing in myself, but thank God I know who I am in Him. And I don't care who likes it, and I don't care what they do, I am not going to shut up. You are the righteousness of God in Jesus Christ, set apart and made holy by the blood of the Lamb. You are a new creature in Him, anointed, called, delivered, sanctified, and set free. Well, do you know who you are in Christ? Do you have confidence in Him? 
or do you have a serious case of identity theft? You're letting the enemy steal who you really are and maybe you spend way too much time competing with other people and comparing yourself with them. You know, you don't have to live in fear.